Hello, and thank you for joining us today for Frost & Sullivan's latest webinar from our Transformational Health Practice. Today's event is titled, The Picture-Perfect Future of the U.S. Medical Imaging Industry. My name is Anna, and I oversee Frost & Sullivan's Growth, Innovation, and Leadership Briefings. Before we begin today's event, I'd like to go over a few quick notes. This presentation will be available immediately on demand and you can view it at the conclusion of the webinar. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation, and you can do that by clicking on the Ask a Question button. You can also safely share this webcast at any time by clicking on the Share button. On today's presentation, we will have some detailed slides, so there's a full screen feature available to you at the bottom right hand corner of the presentation screen. Our presenters today are Tanvir Janikathan, Senior Research Analyst, and also Siddharth Saha, Vice President of Research for our Transformational Health Practice here at Frost & Sullivan. And joining us today is special guest Shannon Werp, President and COO of VRAD. With that, I would now like to hand the presentation over to Siddharth. Thank you, Anna. <clears throat> uh, good morning to uh, colleagues in the Americas region and good afternoon to colleagues in Europe and further east. Uh, my name is Siddharth Saha and I'm delighted to kickstart the 2018 Analyst Briefing Series from the Medical Imaging and Informatics Group uh, within the Transformation Health Practice at Fuss and Sullivan. Now the industry, uh, the imaging industry is going through a pretty interesting uh, time right now uh, with, with several questions around the role of radiology with the, you know, with the advent of uh, outcomes-based healthcare, with the profession actually starting to think and ask about options uh, for a seat at the decision-making table, uh, pretty exciting possibilities in terms of uh, future trends, the, the role of precision diagnostics, uh, new technologies like artificial intelligence, uh, but at the same time, regulatory change, political uncertainty, uh, issues like adoption of quality metrics and what that means for a radiology practice. Uh, this briefing is a summary of our views from recently conducted uh, research, and it addresses um, questions and issues impacting the profession, um, so radiologists, uh, business managers who actually run radiology practices, um, the solutions and system suppliers um, who, you know, who are continuously looking at innovative business models apart from technologies uh, to, serve, to serve the profession, and last but not the least, uh, the payers. On the first slide, we kind of thought of putting together the high-level themes, the most important themes that stand out uh, when we look at the U.S. Uh, industry. Um, so I'd like to kind of introduce um, or invite Shannon Verb uh, to kind of give uh, some opening comments around the big main themes uh, impacting the U.S. industry. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I just thought I'd take a moment real briefly to make sure that we orient everybody um, on the on the webinar uh, about VRED's business and and uh, just to try to help a little bit with our perspective as we move through the presentation. So uh, VRED is a, a very large, uh, historically has been a teleradiology provider, uh, predominantly in the United States. Uh, our business really grew out of providing preliminary interpretations in the overnight uh, space and over the course of the last oh five to seven years that business has been shifting to providing final services um, to interacting directly with payers uh, whereas in a preliminary and even sometimes in finals oftentimes we bill fee for service to our clients and most recently with uh, the acquisition of VRED by Mednax we're now growing much more into the 24 by 7 full-service radiology space through a series of partnerships, uh, affiliated practices, which, which are joining Mednax uh, around the country. 
Uh, and so although uh, we started in the overnight with prelims, we're definitely really seeing a shift in the definition of teleradiology and the types of services organizations like ours provide. Um, so even with VRAD, uh, we definitely see these, these three key themes coming forward in our business and our affiliated practices businesses. Uh, we're starting to see a, a, a significant shift of patient volume out of the inpatient or even hospital outpatient based into the imaging center space. And I think recently many of you probably saw announcements from some of the major payers around really steering patients in that direction. The last couple of years, radiology has definitely been dealing with the shift from fee-for-service to pay for quality. Uh, I think some of the early efforts around uh, things like PQRS um, were really a lot of administrative burden, and, and I think with MIPS and MACRA, we're starting to have a lot more active participation in what radiology-based quality programs should look like moving forward. Um, and then finally, we're really excited. VRAD is an innovative organization. We manufacture a lot of the technology that our physicians use today, and so we really see this opportunity to bring data and analytics together, driving uh, innovation in places like workflow and artificial intelligence to really help our physicians do a better job and really organize the treatment specific to you know, pre precision diagnostics and outcomes-based medicine, as mentioned on the slide. Thank you, Shannon. And uh, Tanvir, would you like to <clears throat> make a comment on the, the key themes here? Sure, Sid. Uh, thank you. So my um, take on the future of the U.S. medical imaging industry is going to be predominantly about empowering the radiologist because as the payments shift from fee-for-service to value-based, it's going to be very important for the entire imaging ecosystem or, and the stakeholders within, whether you're a, a payer or a provider or an OEM, to help change the role of a radiologist from basically someone that interprets an image in a silo to someone that actually plays a very pivotal role throughout the entire patient care pathway. And as we go through this presentation, we're going to be looking at exactly what the industry is doing and what the industry will be doing towards empowering that radiologist as well as the provider in order to cope with this shift in, in regulation and the shift in payment methodology from predominant fee-for-service to sort of value-based. Um, Sid, you can move on to the next slide. Sure. So pretty, <clears throat> pretty exciting times. Um, especially for the solutions and uh, systems uh, providers as they kind of help the profession, uh, you know, enable uh, its position in the, in the decision-making um, table. Uh, now, we thought it would be useful to provide a context to the industry in the U.S. Um, so there's the business opportunity in, uh, you know, roughly $100 billion, uh, which is itself broken into professional services, the technical fee component, as well as the revenues from um, the sale of solutions and, and systems, the hardware. Uh, we thought we'd spend a couple of minutes uh, just looking at the, the broader issues uh, in, the, uh, in the U.S. industry. We've heard about words like stagnation, slowdown, cutbacks. So we wanted to set, uh, set some context here. Um, Tanvir, do you want to comment about the key, key issues here? Sure, and again, I would like to talk about these. Uh, the radiologists said, um, if you look at the deck, you see that there are about 34,000 radiologists in the U.S. as per the ACR. Now, what's interesting to know is that about 75% of radiologists outside of academic centers uh, seek employment in in private practice, and not so much in hospitals. And and there's no reason to see this sort of trend change in the immediate future. What is interesting, however, is is the changing nature of employment because traditionally radiologists have always looked for a very simple nine to six jobs where they come in they earn their salary and they don't really play much of a process in the decision making or don't have a real say in the procurement for their radiology practice or for the the company that they work for however what we're seeing is there's a subtle shift in 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 the current uh, desire to sort of change the employment models a bit to make the radiologist uh, an equal stakeholder, at least in the decision-making process, to give him or her a sort of empowerment that enables him or her to sort of understand 
the sort of procurements, understand the sort of solutions in the market out there, and have a fair say in, in, in what is procured in order for him or her to qualify for those reimbursements. So I think that is going to be something uh, to look at in the next maybe two to three years. Uh, Shannon, do you have anything to add to this slide? Yes, Sid Tenvir, thanks. So I, you know, the only thing I probably would, would jump in on as well, really uh, the commentary about, you know, the physician's involvement and expectations around what's happening in, in the market. You know, this year, this past uh, couple of years, really, we've seen an increase in consolidation in the market where private practices are choosing to partner with either a financial or strategic sponsor as, as they look to really thrive and grow in today's marketplace. And I, I think this, this discussion you were having around physicians' desire to be more involved and have, an, have a stake really in the the direction of the practice, the services that are offered, the technologies are used. I think that still resonates even in a market where there's consolidation happening. Most of these, these uh, organizations that are out here partnering with practices really have a model where they try to, to create an, an opportunity for there to be a lot of local identity, local control, local engagement. Uh, by the practice, even after the practice chooses to partner with either a financial spark partner or a, or a strategic partner. And so, you know, even though we're seeing consolidation in the space, I don't think it really changes the fact that, you know, medicine and radiology is really practiced very much locally. Um, I, I think the relationships are very much local. Uh, I think the desire to, to innovate uh, uh, occurs locally through the partnerships that you have. I think this consolidation effort really just creates an opportunity for the practices to have more resources behind them to really offer a differentiated service or, or work to do a better job and grow as they move forward. Thank you, Shannon. Now, we wanted to actually take a look at um, some of the challenges uh, faced by various stakeholders. So if we kind of broadly broke out uh, the profession, the business managers, the solutions and system suppliers, um, technology providers, and payers. Um, there's a there's a bunch of challenges that uh, various stakeholders are are, are facing. Now, uh, somebody's problem is actually some you know another party's opportunity. So we wanted to kind of uh, spin the context of of uh, each of the challenges mentioned here. Um, each one of them is not a problem. It also results in an opportunity for another party, especially on the solution and system supplier side of things. So, uh, Tanvir, do you want to talk about some of the, the highlights of, of the, the categories of challenges here? Sure, Sid. So when we look at this uh, particular slide, I want to start, um, you know, high level and talk about some of the uh, regulatory and reimbursement challenges. Now, obviously, 2018 is going to be an important year for healthcare reform. And um, any sort of executive action or any sort of bill or act that's passed through that reduces the number of insured uh, in the population will obviously have a huge trickle-down effect on imaging procedures and volumes and reimbursements. Um, add to that, uh, there has been some deep image, sort of Medicare and third-party cuts to imaging, and this has been happening over the last several years, and that has made an impact and is continuing to make an impact on the imaging industry as a whole. Um, add to that, you have um, a new regulation like MACRA and CDS, which had a lot of pushback in 2017, which is why rollout was delayed to 2018, and there is still a lot of smaller uh, radiology practices and a smaller mom-and-pop establishments that are saying, hey, we don't really have the administrative manpower to be able to deal with this kind of, uh, you know, reporting and, and compliance, so we really don't know how we're going to be able to adapt to this. So there's still a lot of uh, opportunity for OEMs to sort of come in and provide those solutions that help these smaller providers actually automate their data capture, their data reporting uh, in a sort of standardized format that will help them qualify for reimbursement without really having to spend a lot of manpower or resource on it. Now, when we talk about um, concepts like proliferation of new technologies and artificial intelligence, uh, from a radiologist's point of view, um, a radiologist is going to think, hey, 
is artificial intelligence coming from my job? Now, we know that to be a sort of lesser existential threat because we know that artificial intelligence, cloud computing has the ability to augment or improve the functionality of a radiologist. So, but there is still a concern out there. Likewise, a lot of older radiologists need to ask a simple, uh, a simple question. How do I reskill myself? How do I upskill myself? How do I learn to work with these new technologies? Who is going to sort of impart that uh, training? Is it the industry? Is it OEMs? Are radiology groups going to do it? So there's a lot of buzz out there. And also, more importantly, if you are a, a CEO of an imaging provider, uh, if you are the CEO of a radiology uh, group, or if you are the uh, head radiologist of a, uh, of a hospital department, then you're currently faced with a lot of choice in terms of what the amount of technology that's out there. So this current choice can be quite overwhelming, and a lot of decision makers are asking themselves the same question, what, which of these solutions are the best for me, based on my current needs and based on my future needs? So while these can be challenges to radiologists and providers, there can be opportunities for OEMs who can actually work with them to help them understand what best of breed solutions that they can really sort of adopt. And then, um, obviously, standardization is a huge problem in the industry. Now, as I understand it, there are already a lot of tools out there in the market that are actually um, a helping in sort of addressing the issue of standardization, but we must also pay cognizance to the fact that it's a very fragmented uh, delivery market, and, and there's still a lot of work to be done to sort of uh, bring about a complete standardization across the industry, which is um, a few years away. And, and finally, when we talk about interoperability, and, and this has been a challenge for some time now, and why we feel that it's important to mention interoperability is because there was a broad consensus that interoperability as a challenge would be sort of addressed by now, that you know your fourth generation deconstructed packs would go a long way in addressing those challenges, but they remain key issues. I mean, if you really think about it, as per uh, 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 the AHA study of 2015, only 30% of American hospitals are currently fully interoperable, but only about 20% of U.S. hospitals really acknowledging that they use data from other uh, providers. And uh, then again, there's about 35% of your current uh, imaging scans come from your sort of freestanding uh, imaging center. So there's a long way to go in sort of ensuring that 100% interoperability across the U.S. health systems. Um, uh, Shannon, would you like to sort of add something to the discussion here? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to, Tanvir. So I just want to touch on three of these uh, uh, elements, three of the items here on the slide. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm sort of in the, the middle left-hand side, non-standardized radiology reports. You know, I, I think there really is a lot of technology available that helps physician practices to standardize reports from, um, you know, simple use of and development of voice recognition to macros and templates to really highly intelligent, assisted, structured reporting solutions. Uh, I, you know, I think the technology has matured quite a bit, and there's there's an opportunity here with the right sort of cultural and physician leadership within practices to really embrace these kinds of technologies. We at VRAD, as an example, we have a practice of about 500 physicians. We service about uh, 2,000, 2,200 sites in the United States, and uh, every one of the reports that come out of VRAD, be it preliminary or final, all come from and look like they're from uh, VRAD through a structured, templated um, uh, reporting solution that ensures quality metrics are reported against, assures billing efficacy, ensures that the clients are actually able to customize it to meet some of their needs. Maybe they want finding sections uh, reported before the impression section, as an example. So there's a lot of opportunity out there. I think there's there's a lot of capabilities and technology. I think the practices are are really uh, able to embrace uh, uh, some of this technology now. It, it's fairly mature. AI is completely different, though. The box right underneath it, as you indicated earlier, there's been a lot of hype the last few years. I think there's been, you know, perhaps uh, uh, two to three years ago, as this really ramped up, there was some fear, uh, a lot of fud in the market, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. 
relative to AI replacing jobs. We have never seen it this way. I think the industry is now really starting to shape its opinion around taking much smaller bites at the problem and recognizing that AI really can solve point solutions and help doctors do a better job, be it triaging uh, critical findings for physicians on a work list, be it maybe objectively measuring uh, uh, specific elements inside of studies, maybe volumes of blood or, or, or measuring the, the size of a, a lung nodule or something like that, placement of tubes and lines. There's a lot of opportunity to help doctors do a better job, help them be more efficient. This isn't about making them read faster. This is about knowing that if we remove a lot of the objective and administrative burden from physicians, they actually do a better job. Uh, so we really see AI as, as a, a technology that's going to bring a lot of enhancements over the next uh, number of years. And finally, I just want to comment on the commoditization of radiology services. We speak about this quite a bit. We're often kind of thrown into the bucket of driving commoditization. Um, I think the audience should really look at commoditization in, in, a, in multiple lights, right? A lot of times we want to look at the negative aspects of it. But really when you think about commodities, when you think about commodities, you're really starting to drive value for service at an affordable level on top of delivering consistently high quality products or services. And I think that's where radiology is really getting to and has over the last number of years. So commoditization, in our opinion, isn't something that should be feared. It's something that should be embraced by, by high-performing practices and how we can actually deliver a high-value service at the best possible quality. Thank you, Shannon. <clears throat> I would actually agree on the commoditization aspect. Uh, when we think about quality metrics, um, Actually, if we move down the path of standardization and comparable metrics, uh, it just makes things easier to compare how things work on the East Coast versus the West Coast. I guess reimbursement becomes simpler. So while you know we see these road bumps on the horizon, I think the other side is going to be pretty smooth and pretty um, lucrative for, for all, all stakeholders uh, concerned, just to kind of standardize uh, quality, the choices, it, it just makes things um, simpler. Uh, we wanted to actually uh, take a minute on a, on a question. This is an interesting question um, related to the challenges. Um, Shannon, if you don't mind, the question was, with the move away from private practice to employee-based contracts, would that, would that have an impact on the trans changes in, in reimbursement models and you know, the whole move towards value-based uh, systems? Uh, we, we think so. We think that uh, when you look at radiology in the, in the United States, still today the average radiology practice, I believe, is 10 or 15 physicians. Uh, it's a highly fragmented market. Sure, there are a lot of very innovative and large practices out there, and, and that consolidation is really driving that. Uh, but it really takes a practice reaching a certain level before they can make investments relative to you know, pay for quality movement from fee for service to quality based programs. We see uh, these in quote unquote employment models or partnership models as an opportunity to bring a lot more resource to the table. Simple example at Mednax, we have a complete team that only focuses on quality based reimbursement programs. They focus across multiple specialties. They partner with CMS. They drive conversation and technology within the organization in a way that a normal radiology practice would be unable to do on their own. And so we think this creates an opportunity for practices to become much more part of the conversation, A, and be successful implementing such programs. Thank you, Shannon. And uh, before we move on to the next section, I just wanted to pick on one of the questions. There's a question about... Uh, uh, discussion on imaging with surgery uh, navigation systems. Um, so for the person who posed the question, uh, we're not directly talking about that over here, but uh, there is um, some amount of research that the Frost and Sullivan team uh, have published uh, in the area of image-guided therapy uh, and navigation systems. So uh, please do get in touch. We can, we can talk about our insights on that topic. Um, now we'd like to move on to the, uh, the section. Uh, we wanted to actually look at the issues being faced uh, by um, stakeholders. Um, we keep hearing about 
the words uh, outcomes, uh, compensation, uh, bottom line, value-based healthcare. There's a there's a bunch of issues that um, OEMs, radiologists, the profession, payers, and and providers um, face. Um, and Reed, would you like to start off this section about the issues in 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 America? Sure. Thanks, Sid. So when you look at this section, I'm sure that. Um, most everybody here listening in are aware of the sort of uh, high-level philosophical challenges that each of these individual stakeholders face. But what it is, what is interesting to know is that there is a lot of overlap in terms of challenges. You take, for example, uh, a payers, right? Payers are looking primarily to make providers and radiologists more accountable for the care provided, which is why there is a strong emphasis towards risk-based payments and penalization. So there is a lot of scope here for payers to work more closely with radiologists and, and radiology groups to come up with the best of breed approach that's mutually agreeable in terms of what is best for the radiologist, for the radiology group, and for the payer. Likewise, there's a lot of opportunity here for the for the OEMs to actually help radiologists and your um, providers come up with solutions that help them understand the risk, mitigate the risk, and as well as um, devise or, or, or look at what solutions are optimal for providers to adopt in order to actually show that quality improvements are being made in formats that can be reported to qualify for these quality-based reimbursements. So I think that these challenges that are faced by different stakeholders um, provide a very good opportunity for the industry to actually come much closer together and collaborate towards a sort of more picture-perfect future. Uh, Sid Shannon, if you want to jump in now with your thoughts. You know, the only thing I would probably throw uh, additional on this slide, I, I think this is this is a great summary. I was I was happy to see the the reimbursement comment come out. You know, we we hear from our our radiology group partners that you know physician compensation and it has been changing significantly, and with declining reimbursement and the push to really work harder, do more with less. You know, that's a key concern. But I really think when you when you put all four of these together, radiologists, OEM, equipment manufacturers, payer expectations, uh, payer needs, uh, 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 providers, I think the game is changing a little bit um, when you when you blend these together. In that the radiology practices of the future, especially when you look at this trend towards consolidation and getting larger, I like to talk about it as you know physician practices are going to bring their own toys. They're not necessarily going to bring all of the tools used in the enterprise for imaging, uh, but at VRAD, as an example, we manufacture all the technology used by our physicians to interpret the studies, uh, and that's, a, that's part of the service that we provide. I think that trend increases, and I think that changes the relationship between the, the providers, payers, radiologists, and the OEMs specifically. The OEMs are going to be focused much more enterprise. I think the practices are going to start bringing a lot of their own diagnostic tools. So I think it's going to shift that focus a bit. Thank you, Shannon. Um, now, our next section in the presentation uh, is, a, is a summary of where we are in the industry in the, in the United States um, as we speak. Um, now we have a, we have we've touched upon a bunch of things here technologies um, the strategic imperative the role of uh, radiology uh, we have also seen over the last uh, 12 to 18 months uh, a lot of focus amongst the systems and solution providers to improve uh, productivity improve the business not just about faster you know quicker machines but about helping the business uh, achieve um, bottom line. Now, I also wanted to point out, uh, we do have a question around the role of AI uh, compared to CAD, as well as a question around um, the, the, the outcomes within a radiology report. Uh, so, Shannon, if you don't mind talking about it from your uh, company's perspective. Uh, but before that, then we, I'd like you to just take us through uh, the, the, the main messages here. Sure. Thanks, Sid. 
So these are in uh, summation some of the current trends that we see shaping the uh, US medical imaging industry today and it's important to put these sort of trends in context. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, the underlying philosophy of the medical imaging industry was get bigger, which meant more scans, more volumes, more procedures, more patients. And a lot has happened in the last 10 years. And with uh, the Medicare sort of cuts coming in, third party cuts coming in, with a sort of uncertain political and regulatory environment hanging overhead for some years now, the emphasis has shifted away from get bigger to uh, a get better philosophy and this uh, for this to become a reality the industry has sort of emphasized cost reduction and uh, sort of improved efficiency all without any compromise on quality so in order for this to become a reality these are some of the um, overarching trends that we are witnessing that are actually contributing to this sort of uh, get better utopia and um, we see some of the usual suspects here. We see, for example, cloud computing. I think that's a, uh, one of the most important trends. A, because cloud computing has ensured that providers don't need to purchase expensive hardware and software. They can actually purchase space based on the number of images that they need to upload. Cloud computing can be paired with artificial intelligence for analytics. It can enable faster sharing, and more importantly, as we will be seeing later in the presentation, it actually helps radiologists connect with multidisciplinary teams in real time to play a much more important role in the patient care pathway. Uh, when we look at sort of artificial intelligence, um, obviously AI, the full benefits of AI is something that's go really going to be realized maybe two, three years down the line. But why we feel it's topical and it's important to mention today because AI is already playing a very important role in terms of improving the efficiency of the imaging workflow, in terms of improving the diagnostic accuracy of images, in terms of improving the, uh, the, the time with which diseases are detected. And um, I, I would say that probably the most important, the most critical goal of the imaging industry today is improving the patient experience. Now, improving the patient experience is critical to demonstrate quality improvements. Now, that can include, for example, faster scans. Uh, Siemens has its continuous bed motion, which helps actually reduce the scan time, reduce the amount of dosage, which makes the scan safer, which allows the sort of provider to perform more scans in the day. It could be, uh, you know, taking that image and using quantitation and volumetric analysis to sort of improve the efficacy that you derive from the image. But making the patient an empowered stakeholder and improving the patient experience is identified widely as the single most important sort of objective of the imaging industry today. Now, lastly, what I want to touch upon is personalized medicine. Now, it's very important to emphasize that personalized medicine is something that is I would say several years away in terms of making an impact. Why I am including it now here today is simply because when we look at personalized medicine, we're looking at targeted therapies uh, for diseases based on the molecular or genetic makeup. And we're seeing some very exciting new sort of trends in, in molecular imaging, in PET and SPECT imaging. We're seeing PET move away from traditional oncology and into new clinical areas. Likewise, we're seeing SPECT move from cardiology to new clinical areas. And we're seeing a lot of new, exciting radio pharmaceuticals come out in the market. And we're seeing a quantum leaps in PET and SPECT quantitation. So what we're seeing today is effectively the groundwork being laid to do the sort of research required for personalized medicine, which will become a reality maybe a few years down the line. Uh, that having said, Shannon, I'll turn it to you to sort of give, uh, give us your inputs on this slide and maybe what VRAD is doing um, in terms of uh, uh, sort of addressing the, 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 these trends in, in the current imaging landscape. Sure. Thanks, Tanvir. So, so I'll, I'm going to try to tackle two of the questions. Uh, which relate to this slide. The first one is on vision of AI and how AI is being used. You know, we, we actually see the use of artificial intelligence. I, I've, I've equated it to like it's another tool in the toolbox. Uh, we focus our innovation here very much around really, really two fronts, our workflow engine 
uh, which really drives how our clients interact with our physicians, and then of course the diagnostic tools within the PACS. And so uh, we're, con we're constantly trying to solve um, uh, challenges, uh, create opportunities for our physicians to be able to do a better job. Maybe it's as simple as listening to them dictate a critical finding and automatically dialing the phone for them so they don't need to look up a phone number or our operation center team doesn't need to assist in that phone call. It can happen automatically. To maybe as, adva as advanced as testing a head CT against an algorithm to look for um, the presence of intracranial hemorrhage and elevating that on a work list. And so for us, AI is, is one of those tools that we may choose to use to solve some of those, those business problems that we run into, those, those clinical challenges that we run into. Um, and so in, in, in a sense, the question really leads to, are we really using AI or is it more about CAD? And, and, and I think uh, uh, in certain places, you, you, you need to use the right tool to solve the problem depending upon what you're facing. Uh, and so historically, AI hasn't been used a lot in this space, and I think that's changing, and I think it will continue to change. On the NLP front, though, I think that's is another place where artificial intelligence can be used. Today at VRAD, we actually have two different environments. When the physician dictates, we use an NLP-like technology to help format the report before it goes out uh, to our client. And then we use a different NLP technology on the back end to try to extract qualitative information from the report. We think there's an opportunity to pull those two things together and do that at the time of dictation when you're actually providing care for the patient. Today, we do not actually suggest findings to the physicians in the report. We think that's an opportunity in the future, but of course, regulatory, the FDA is going to step in a lot more when you start to actually suggest outcomes to the physician. Triage is a different story. AI for triage allows us to really look at that much more like workflow on a work list when you're not actually hinting to the physician uh, that, that there might be a finding present. So the second question that I wanted to address here, the rise of teleradiology. 5% of all studies are interpreted by teleradiologists. You know, I, my gut tells me that number is about right. Um, I think that number is increasing. I, you know, I, I have a pretty good feeling for where VRAD's number is, and we're, we're, we're probably the largest provider of teleradiology services, both, both night and day, um, including uh, subspecialty services. And, and I really think that it's this drive towards subspecialty, as well as this, you know, uh, a challenge around recruiting physicians uh, that, that kind of ebbs and flows uh, year over year that really pushes towards the use of teleradiologists. A big part of our business, uh, probably our most significant growth in 2017, was actually daytime subspecialty services. Um, on the back end of that, we were surprised to also see huge growth in uh, fellowship-trained subspecialty pediatric interpretations 24 by 7. And this drive really is coming from the hospital to the local practices, which are then looking to VRED to help them solve those challenges. So, you know, I, I see I see uh, this rise of teleradiology really in response to the demands being placed on the groups by the hospitals. Thank you, Shannon. Um, now, the section, <clears throat> the following section, looks at um, the evolving role of the uh, the key stakeholders in the profession, the radiologists, uh, moving away from a passive role to an active um, decision-making seat on the table. Uh, we do have a question about, um, you know, with, with all the outcomes and the contribution that imaging diagnostics can make, is there a view that uh, hospitals and imaging departments will actually need more specialized radiologists? So I'd like to kind of take a look at that question in the context of the slide. As the role changes, as the need for skills changes, is there a need for more specialized uh, professionals simply because of the, you know, the growing contribution of imaging diagnostics in the care um, continuum? Um, uh, Tanvir, if you'd like to start off with this, this uh, section. Sure. So uh, what I'm going to do is first quickly sort of run through the slide and then provide my answer to that question. Um, when we look at the current role of radiologists, Right. It's important to understand that the radiologist, by and large, still works in a uh, silo. His or her job is to interpret the image and then sort of send that report on to the physician who 
decides on a best course of treatment. Now, obviously, this is not going to work uh, we, we, given the fact that future reimbursements are going to be tied towards quality and, and, co and sort of improvement activities. And um, so the radiologist now needs to be able to play a more active part in the care uh, pathway of the patient in order to very clearly showcase that he or she is contributing meaningfully towards an improved patient outcome. Now, for that reality to happen, I think that the OEMs and, and providers have a huge role to play in empowering the radiologist. And, and the first thing is to help the radiologist improve his, his turnaround time. And whether that would mean adopting sort of uh, deep learning algorithms that can actually triage images and, and select the ones based on severity and place them on the radiologist sort of uh, desk before the other images, that's going to be a huge step in terms of helping radiologists actually turn around those images that require priority. Also, in order to bring the radiologist out of a silo and make him or her part of a, a multidisciplinary team, uh, they need the right set of tools. So this is where I think cloud computing is going to play an important role. Um, cloud computing is going to play a sort of uh, a role in, in connecting radiologists with multidisciplinary teams of, of physicians and, and sort of uh, specialists. Uh, so that data can be shared, images can be shared in real time, and the radiologist has an active and equal say in helping uh, these sort of uh, stakeholders plan uh, the, the patient treatment cycle. And what the radiologist can also do is actually compare longitudinal studies of the um, a patient treatment and then make recommendations and changes in real time based on what he's looking at. And finally, um, I think an, another major role that radiologists are going to be playing in the future, and again this ties into personalized medicine, is uh, fundamentally not just simply providing a, a diagnosis based on looking at an image saying, okay, this is lung cancer or, or this is a brain tumor, but actually helping in identifying the molecular or genetic markup of the disease. Because that's going to play a very important role in terms of um, helping doctors and physicians create a personalized treatment plan that is suited for the for the particular disease type, and and this and these sort of changes are going to really help radiologists say very decisively that they are contributing to sort of improved quality outcomes, helping them sort of qualify for uh, those quality based reimbursements. Now, coming to the question on um, the um, hospitals, bear with me, I just need to take a look at that question here. Um, yes, I think that there, there is certainly going to be a need for uh, sub-specializations because, look, radiology or, or medical imaging did not receive the sort of due treatment by large hospitals and, and health systems over the last few years. It wasn't inherently uh, seen as profitable or, or important to the business, uh, which is why it was sort of deprioritized and, and over, as, as the sort of wave of consolidations took place over the last few years, there was a strong emphasis towards sort of uh, acquiring as many freestanding imaging providers as possible and having them sort of um, outsource the work to these centers that were acquired. But a lot of that thinking is changing. Radiology, as radiologists certainly fight for their sort of seat at the table and demand that they be heard in, in the decision-making process, hospitals are waking up to the reality that there is going to be a, a great emphasis for sort of super specialization. Now, obviously, not all hospitals have the sort of resources to be able to employ um, a radiologist with, uh, with sub-specializations. And this is where I think teleradiology is going to play a very huge role, uh, A, in terms of being able to sort of um, have that image read and, and turned around in real time. But then again, this is something that I would turn to Shannon to answer because um, uh, at VRAD, I'm sure he's already have, uh, he already has a lot of experience uh, with the demands for sub-specialization. Shannon, your thoughts? <clears throat> yeah, this really comes back to the comment I was making earlier about 
a lot of this drive we see comes from the hospital to the practices, and the practices then look to partner with VRAD to try to fill in those gaps. You know, we'll, we'll actually work with practice partners on what we call a virtual FTE that's subspecialized in every subspecialty that doesn't, you know, take a break, that doesn't go on vacation, um, you know, that, that is awake 24 hours a day. Now, of course, that's multiple physicians on a roster, but it allows us to help fill in these gaps for practices where they may not have them. But we're definitely seeing a drive and a push towards not just, you know, historically favor subspecialty. Now we're seeing demands from clients where they're actually requiring subspecialty interpretations for specific studies. So we're seeing that happen across the country. Right. Thank you, Shannon. Um, <clears throat> I was pretty intrigued uh, by this next section in terms of um, uh, some of the changes in the in the in the industry, um, and this is the the use of big data. So we we, we know that in um, there's a lot of talk and there's a lot of need to monitor utilization, uh, the top line and obviously the bottom line. And you've got here technology, you know, life cycle trends and decisions to make. And one of the big um, big issues that we are seeing uh, where companies, the systems and solution suppliers, working very closely with um, the actual radiology practices and hospitals to leverage that data to actually help with an understanding on technology lifecycle management and, in fact, purchase decisions. Um, so we thought this would be an interesting point um, to place out here, uh, big data, not just on um, clinical uh, decisions, but actually on decisions with regard to choices on equipment, uh, the type of technology, and, and really influencing the, you know, the purchase, uh, purchase behaviors as well. Um, Tanvi, did you want to talk about this? Sure. So, Sid, what I want to add to this slide is that if you are responsible for sales, if you work for an OEM and you're responsible for sales, maybe five, six, seven years ago prior to the first big wave of acquisitions, your prime contact or the prime decision maker was the head of radiology. And, and when you approached him or her, the decision making would be based on science and technology. You would, you would more talk about, hey, this device does more, it has this crystal, it has this array, it has this, it has this particular piece of science that makes it better. Now, as a consequence of the wave of consolidations that have taken place over the last few years, the decision making has increasingly shifted away from the radiologist and more towards the sort of C-suite executive. And, and your C-suite executive really, he isn't a scientist. He is looking more at the sort of business of, of, of the procurement. A, is it going to help him save cost? B, is it going to improve his efficiency and quality? So obviously, as, as a salesperson, the entire priority or the business case that needs to be built has to shift away from science and technology and more towards building a viable sort of uh, a, a business case as to why this uh, acquisition or why this upgrade is, is actually going to help. Now, for that to happen, it's important to be able to gather large quantities of data on hundreds of millions of images from your legacy fleet across the country. Now, once you and, and bear in mind that most of your fleet is pre-internet, so you would have to gather them manually. Now, once you have these disks, you would have to then go through hundreds of millions of images to try and identify pain points in areas of inefficiency. Now, obviously, that can't be done manually given the amount of effort required. This is where it's important to adapt or adopt big data sort of analytics to analyze these sort of millions of images and then identify areas of inefficiency, which you can then take to the uh, sort of C-suite decision maker and say, hey, you have this system. Now, this system with this particular scan has a maybe 60 to 70 percent repeat scan rate. And with our new technology and with this particular upgrade, we're doing away with this repeat scan altogether. And that itself allows you to present a viable business case that actually showcases cost saving and improved efficiency. And it's also important if you are a salesperson working at an OVM to start looking at sort of prescriptive and predictive um, analytics tools because when building a relationship with a CEO or a CXO of an IDN or a large health system, you want to be able to say, hey, these are your current requirements. 
this is the set of products and solutions that you have to address your current requirements based on your historical and current trends but based on our forecast this is what we see are going to be your imaging requirements this is what we see is going to be your sort of customer base and these are the challenges that you are going to be foreseeing in the next 3 or 4 years so maybe this is the sort of tools and and solutions that you need to be adopting over a phased period of time over the coming years now all of this again ties in very importantly to the changing partnership between an OEM and a provider typically when you think of these partnerships it's usually your one off purchase with your maintenance contract attached but what we're seeing is increasingly a lot of larger hospitals and health systems are increasingly getting into these long term sort of risk sharing partnerships with OEMs so that they can mutually cooperate to identify areas where they they can work together build a set of kpis and adopt the right sort of products and technologies that actually help them meet these kpis and i think this is a great place where uh, big data has its uh, advantages great point anvir and i i think that's a great note with which uh, to kind of look at um what's the future what, what what's in store from a future perspective um then we i realize we've got just under 10 minutes so we've got three sections three main issues on um future trends the role right in supporting population health management the right. role on quality metrics and then clinical decision support so let's let's right. take a look at each one of them um and and then we'd like to kind of summarize sure so um I'll just uh, go through this slide very quickly and turn it over to Shannon and, and get his thoughts. So when we talk about population health management, obviously the big buzz is about moving from episodic based care to population health management. There's nothing new in that. But again, whether it's within an imaging context or whether it's sort of a global healthcare context, it's still a long way off because as I said earlier, interoperability remains a huge challenge. Only 30% of hospitals are uh, really fully interoperable as per the AHA reports, and I think that what medical imaging wants to do vis-a-vis -vis population health management is to help providers sort of stratify their patient base into four different categories whether it's sort of very high risk categories which are sort of uh, acutely ill uh, you know your high risk patients that are sort of uh, uh, chronically ill or have or suffering from subacute conditions your moderate risk patients that uh, have family history or genetic predisposition to particular diseases or maybe your low risk patients the idea is once you've been able to stratify your patients based on their imaging history not from just when they became your patients but from their previous doctors and their previous radiologists and their previous care providers are you able to build a viable sort of patient map where you're able to allocate the kind of resources and the technologies that you're going to need to sort of monitor your patient base over the coming years and i think that this is the sort of utopia that uh, not just imaging but the whole health system is heading towards over and and this is something that's going to take a few years uh, and and obviously all of this depends on improving the overall interoperability and and data sharing which is why i would classify this firmly in the sort of future trends even though it's spoken about more in the current context uh, shannon do you have any thoughts on this i'd only add just to connect this back to the previous slide about the data and leveraging data as we develop these solutions this is really going to be about us figuring out how to harness all of the data that's available to help us stratify these patients but beyond that i thought the description was excellent we can move on sid sure and then we have quality metrics and the role that that can play right so quality metrics i think that this is uh, going to be the single most uh or rather the the most important sort of objective of the imaging industry going forward now i've been sort of looking at quality metrics since 2016 and um 
it, and quality metrics, it's important to put quality metrics in, in context with MACRA because radiologists are in patient facing, about 85% of reimbursement is going to be tied to quality and about 15% to improvement activities. Now there are about uh, an estimated 100, 150 radiologists in the country that are direct patient facing, so they come under a, a separate uh, weightage, but the majority of radiologists would come under non-patient facing. So how does a radiologist that is not patient facing really uh, prove that he is actually contributing towards an improved patient outcome. And that's where quality metrics comes in. Currently, the, 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 the go-to, what do you say, method for reporting metrics are registries. The good news is the ACR is actually working with the industry, it's working with radiology groups and working with individual radiologists to actually develop quality metrics. And there are about around 60 metrics as of 2016 that are accepted and can be used uh, uh, for submission, but there's still a long way to go. And with MACRA coming into sort of force in 2018, quality metrics is going to be the sort of um, focus of the industry in order to provide a standardized format through which data can be submitted and reimbursements can be claimed. Um, Shannon, do you want to talk about what's happening in quality metrics uh, and within a VRAD context in particular? Sure, I'd be happy to. I mean, when you start to think about quality reporting and quality metrics for radiology practices and then ramp that up across hundreds of physicians and thousands of sites, you can imagine the challenges that one might encounter when trying to be successful there. Uh, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier in the presentation, but historically, you know, me personally at least, I've been frustrated with quality reporting within radiology. Uh, plays in nicely to this slide here as well, in, in that it really has been very much an administrative burden for the radiologists. Uh, I'll give you one of the PQRS reporting metrics was the dose reduction technique used on CT scanners. Um, and and for, for some practices, they may actually be involved in having that conversation with the facilities, either in the purchasing or implementation of the protocols of those scanners. But for many other practices, that's simply not the case. For a practice like VRAD, we're not involved in those conversations at all. Yet, we had the burden of reporting those quality metrics. Now, we were able to get all 2,000 facilities to attest their dose reduction techniques and, techniques and automate the process of inserting that into the header of the report so our physicians didn't have to dictate it, you know, relatively speaking, 20,000 times a day. Um, I'm, I'm really just excited about where MIPS and MACRA is heading relative to allowing practices to be more involved and come to the table and have a conversation about how they can contribute to a quality conversation versus just an administrative burden of reporting in the diagnostic report. Right. Thanks, Shannon. And when we look at um, oh, just one more thing to add on quality metrics, what I'd like to say right now is that uh, there is a very limited synergy between uh, industry and radiologists, between OEMs and radiologists and radiology groups. And we feel that metrics right now are developed based on existing quantitation technology where really uh, it's really the metric that needs to be thought of first with the quantitation tools being built around that. So there's a really a long way to go, but there's a lot of opportunity and sort of scope for collaboration between, uh, you know, providers and, and, and OEMs and, and, and radiologists and radiology groups. Uh, but finally, coming to clinical decision support, I think clinical decision support is going to be important. It's going to be important in, in terms of the way that physicians recommend uh, imaging scans it's going to redefine the way imaging is sort of conducted in the United States. And there are already a lot of, I think about half a dozen companies that um, actually have, uh, what do you say, um, CDS tools, including uh, uh, teleradiology firms. For example, RadNet has its own uh, sort of CDS support tool that follows ACR, RAD peer guidelines. And I think this is an important area for OEMs because OEMs really need to work with providers and OEMs to, to, to develop technologies that fit within the CDS framework. And that also ties into reimbursement, and this is something that uh, payers need to look out for because at the end of the day, the physician that recommends the scan has implications for the radiologist in terms of sort of penalties and quality. Um, uh, Shannon, would you have anything to add on CDS? No, I just want to reinforce that point 
that the ordering physician is responsible for consulting the CDS, the Clinical Decision Support Solution, uh, assuring that they're using appropriate use criteria, yet the radiologist is who will be held responsible for ensuring that that, that clinical decision support uh, tool was consulted in the form of possible uh, reduction or penalty on payment for Medicare patients. And so radiology clearly needs to be involved in this conversation. I think we need to embrace this conversation, uh, not so much around you know, controlling or curbing the growth of, of imaging, but much more around improving the quality of the outcomes for the procedures are per, that are performed on, on patients that are being seen in radiology. Thank you, Shannon. And um, we've just got about a minute uh, in terms of a summary. Um, so then we, would, you, would you agree that um, several challenges different stakeholders, there's going to be different behaviors and choices to be made, um, but and the only way forward is if there's, there's, a, a, there's a more collaboration between all the different you know, stakeholders in, in, in this ecosystem. There, there has to be a, a common move. And I think in general we feel that the future is, is really bright. It's, it's paving the way for you know, removing those inefficiencies, better solutions. Eventually, I, I think the profession will win the um, you know, the, the community and the patients will also benefit. And, and most importantly, um, radiology will, you know, truly get a, a role on, in, the, in the care continuum. And when you think about the care continuum of the future, with precision diagnostics, and we've seen some interesting, you know, interesting news uh, in, in the press over the last few days with, you know, the molecular diagnostics companies working very closely with the imaging companies. Um, so pretty interesting um, outlook for the future. But any any closing comments, Shannon and Tanvir? Nothing from me, Sid. Shannon? Sorry, Sid, I was on mute there. I would just add that this is a nice summary slide which points to some of the content we're distributing through the attachments and links, um, how to thrive in a changing radiology environment, and then a uh, white paper we put out, Becoming a High Performance Radiology Practice. We view the future as bright. Uh, we think practices that really embrace some of these changes are going to be highly successful in the future. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Anna. Thank you so much. Now, any questions that we did not get to address today, the team will take that offline and get, get back with you. And for those that have joined us uh, late, the presentation will be available immediately on demand. Um, and so this concludes today's webinar. Once again, we'd like to thank Shannon Ware for joining us uh, today. And please continue to contact us with any questions or additional feedback. Thank you.